Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Wow, so awesome. Pastor Daniel, it is incredible that this place is full on a Sunday night. So overwhelmed by God's presence. I sure hope I can preach. Hope you got a Bible or something uh, that can look up a Bible for you. We're going to look at a... uh, a lengthy passage of scripture. I generally start preaching by telling a story. I won't be doing that tonight. And everybody said, sorry. It's kind of the fun way to start preaching. Praise the Lord. We are going to look at an entire chapter, which is quite unusual as well in my style of preaching. I usually narrow it down to just a couple of verses and then preach, expound out of those few verses. Are you taking my picture? I don't have my glasses on, but I think that's what you're doing. I want to invite those of you, this is family night. We don't have any children's ministry tonight intentionally. We did that on purpose for the uh, reason of we want families to worship together. My children frequently ask if they can go sit by their friends. And if you're a mom and dad here wondering why I won't let them come sit by your children, it isn't because I think less of your children. It's because I want them by me and worship together with me I want them to see me worship and hear me pray for them. That's why. That's why we do that on Sunday night. So I do recognize there's a number of our children's ministry team here this evening. Thank you so much for your service on Sunday mornings, Wednesday night. Thank you so much. You may not realize it, but you are one of the premier ministry to families in the entire state. Your service that you do is something unprecedented in all of KC when you look at the ratio of children to the number of uh, the, the whole attendance. God's doing something special among our families. We have a, a children's event for our team. You may see the flyer. The flyer probably looks like a big party for kids. It's not. It's for our team. It's a children's, uh, what's it called? I've lost my mind. What? Certification. Certification seminar. It's this Saturday. We want to take our, our incredible ministry and move it up a notch. What God intends for us to become as a church in in the realm of us reaching families and children is going to require us to all get on the same page in a number of areas. We're going to start doing that this Saturday. Please come. Please change your plans. Please fill out the little uh, sign me up card at the information desk so that we know who's coming. We can be equipped for you. It's going to be a great time. It's from 9 to 1. Yeah, it's a long time. It'll be worth it. We're going to have a great time, and we're all, we're all going to become what God intends for KC Alaska to become in the realm of reaching children and families. I remember when I was sitting with Brother Wally looking at, and, and Pastor Daniel looking at the plans of the building was someone who was helping us, somebody helping us examine space and and hallways and things, and they noticed this large room set aside to reach children, and they asked me, well, how many kids are you planning on putting in there? I said, more than 300, and they looked at me like, are are you you crazy? No, it's God's intention that that be filled with 300 kids 
two, three, four times a week. That's God's intention. I'm so proud to be a part of what God's doing at this time in history. What a great time to put your hand on the plow. We're going to look at a chapter in Genesis. And yes, I'm going to read 90% of the entire chapter because I have to. What the chapter contains is what God wants me to somehow get out of me in the few minutes I've got left after so much of Pastor Daniel's offering teaching there. I was about to take the mic and take over because it. I need time to get this out. I took my glasses off so I can't see his expression at this particular moment. Or yours. Genesis. If you've got something to take notes on. Oh, did we get those passed out? Hey, look, it looks official. It's even got a logo on it. How about that? Uh, Genesis 24, I'm going to read from the NIV, and I'm going to read fast. Let's stand together. To honor the word. Genesis 24. If you can keep up, read along with me. Here we go. I'm reading from the 1984 version of the NIV. Might be different than what you have. I don't like the new one. It's weird. Okay. Okay. Abraham was now old and well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to the chief servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, Put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I am living, but will go to my country and my own relatives to get a wife for my son Isaac. The servant asked him, What if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I then take your son back to the country you came from? Make sure that you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household and my native land and who spoke to me and promised me on oath, saying, to your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you so that you can get a wife for my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you will be released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. Verse 9, so the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and left, taking with him all kinds of good things from his master. He set out for Aram Nehoram, something, and made his way to the town of Nahor. He had the camels kneel down near the well outside the town. It was toward evening, the time the women go out to draw water. Then he prayed, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, give me success today and show me kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a girl, please let down your jar that I I may have a drink. And she says, drink, I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you've chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before he had finished praying, Rebekah came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Beth- Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. The girl was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever lain with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. The servant hurried to meet her and said, Please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, and quickly, uh, she said, and quickly lowered the jar t- to her hands and gave him a drink. After she had given him, a drink, giving him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too, till they had finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water, and drew enough for all his camels. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took out a gold nose ring weighing a becca and two gold bracelets weighing ten shekels. Then he asked, whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? Verse 24, then 
<clears throat> she answered him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son that Milcah bore to Nahor. She added, we have plenty of straw and fodder as well as room for you to spend the night. Then the man bowed down and worshiped the Lord, saying, praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. The girl ran and told her mother's household about these things. Now Rebekah had a brother named Laban, and he hurried out to the man at the spring as soon as he had seen the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms and heard that Rebecca, heard Rebecca tell what the man had said to her, he went out to the man and found him standing by the camels near the spring. Come, you who are blessed by the Lord, he said. Why are you standing out here? I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. So the man went to the house and the camels were unloaded. Straw and fodder were brought for the camels, and water for him and his men to wash their feet. Then food was set before him, but he said, I will not eat until I have told you what I have to say. Then tell us. So then he recounts everything I just read all over again. Skip to verse 50. <laughs> Laban and Bethuel answered, this is from the Lord. And somebody said, hallelujah. hallelujah. Right? We can say nothing to you one way or the other. Here is Rebecca. Take her and go. Let her become the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has directed. When Abraham's servant heard what they said, he bowed down to the ground before the Lord. Then the servant brought out gold and silver jewelry and articles of clothing and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave costly gifts to her brother and to her mother. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night there. When they got up the next morning, he said, send me on my way to my master. But her brother and her mother replied, let the girl remain with us 10 days or so, then you may go. But he said to them, do not detain me now that the Lord has granted success to my journey. Send me on my way so that I may go to my master. Then they said, let's call the girl and ask her about it. So they called Rebecca and asked her, will you go with this man? I will go, she said. So they sent her, their sister Rebecca on their on her way, along with her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men. They blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you increase to thousands upon thousands. May your offspring possess the gates of their enemies. 61. Then Rebekah and her maids got ready and mounted their camels and went back with the man. So the servant took Rebekah and left. Now Isaac had come from Beer Lahai, Roy, where he was living in the Negev. He went out into the field one evening to meditate, and as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. Rebekah also looked up and saw Isaac. She got down from her camel and asked the servant, Who is that man in the field coming to meet us? He's my master, the servant answered. So she took her veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all he had done. Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother Sarah, and he married Rebekah. So she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Father, help me get this out. Help us to hear what you want to say. Give us ears to hear. Spirit of God, come, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for remaining standing while I read all that. That was a long chapter. It's important that we looked at a very important character in this story. There are a number of things that could be preached from this message. The picture of the bride, the, the oath that was taken, uh, a number of things, but there's one character I want to focus on that just happens to be for tonight. Pastor Daniel, unbeknownst to him, asked me, as he was asking me earlier this week if I would preach, he asked me if I would preach on Sunday night. Before I could answer, he changed it to Wednesday night. And I knew this word was for tonight, so I just waited I'll preach this on Wednesday night. Wednesday night, the, I'll let l the Lord be God. And then this morning, Pastor Daniel asked me if I'd preach tonight instead. Absolutely, I'm ready. I know this word is for tonight. It's family night. There's a reason all the kids are sitting here. All the boys and girls, say I. I, I want you to hear what God has to say tonight. Because if you'll hear it and do it your whole life, will be directed by the Lord, and it will be blessed. Write some things down. Hey, you on the front row, right over here, write some things down tonight. I'm so 
blessed to be the dad of five kids and a beautiful servant of the Lord. I just want to acknowledge my family real quick. Can you guys stand up? Thank you. Minister Kimmy runs our everything under kindergarten ministry back there. Early childhood ministry and does an amazing job taking care of our little ones. I don't have an ounce of anointing to take care of little ones like she does. Praise the Lord. I want to look at the servant of Abraham. And on your notes, you can see it there, and you can just write these things. We're going to go down a list. We're going to use this as a gauge for our own serving. And as we go down through these things here, which you should have uh, the servant on one side, the servant, the chief servant on one side, and on the other side, you've got something that we're going to go over in a little bit that comes as a reflection of my working with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people to serve the Lord. But I want to look at the chief servant. And I'm so stirred up by this servant personally, and I hope to stir you up. Because I want to be like the chief servant. And let's take a look at a number of things. We're going to jump around here. Luke, use this as a, maybe as a, a reflection, a mirror. See which portions of this chief servant are happening in your life and maybe which some of them need polishing and maybe some of them need jump-started for you to fulfill what God has got for you. Let's look at the first one. The chief servant was trustworthy. Write it in your notes. He could be trusted. He's trustworthy. I don't have a copy of those notes in front of me, so I hope I get it right. (laughs) He was trustworthy. He was put in charge of all of Abraham's wealth. He was sent on the most important errand that Abraham had ever sent anyone. It was the quest to get a wife for his son, Isaac. The promises given to Abraham were going to flow through Isaac. It was critical that he get the right one for Isaac, for the promises of the Lord to come about. The things that he had waited his whole life, oh thanks, the things that he had waited his whole life and didn't see, things that he was contending for and waiting for God to do from the time he was young and he hadn't seen the fulfillment of those things and he knew they were going to come through his son Isaac. So this mission wasn't just, hey, can you go out and check the mail for me? This was utmost critical mission. Who was he going to trust to get that done? Somebody that was trustworthy. So he gives it to this chief servant. There's a principle of being used by God that is often referenced in our KC DNA. This person here was a great, dim uh, picture of it and it's something we need to put in our own life Luke 16 10 is anybody familiar with Luke 16 10 if you're not why don't you look it up in your Bible real quick Luke 16 10 it's a principle of being trustworthy in the kingdom of God and seeing elevation come to you which is always a great great quest of our human nature is to advance and to move forward and be you know, more than we were. But take a look at what Jesus says to his disciples in Luke 16, 10. It says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, Who will give you property of your own? What's your level of trustworthiness? Where are you at on that scale? If Abraham had to send you out for Isaac's wife, could he send you? Great question to think about. The next thing, take a look at verse 5. 
Verse 5, chapter 24. We're back on this story here. It says, The servant asked him, What if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I then take your son back to the country you came from? I don't want you to miss this. Because there is a principle in serving God called how can it be done? There's a lot of people that approach serving and doing something for God and they get ran over in their mind by, well, it probably can't be done. They try one way to get it done and then quit and say, well, I guess not. This servant did not have that approach. He comes back to Abraham and gives him a, I want to get it done. If it doesn't happen this way, can I do it this way? It's a how can it be done approach to serving. Give, you're given the task. The task, the charge has now been done. I am going to get this done. If it doesn't happen the way you said, can I do it this way instead? Can it be done? A very important attitude especially when you're serving in the kingdom of God because we have to recognize the devil doesn't want us to do anything for God. And whatever keeps you from serving God will keep keeping you from serving God until you finally say, I am going to get this done. God's called me to do this. I'm going to do it no matter what it costs me. I'm going to figure out a way to get this done. Whatever that is that God's called you to do. You have to persevere in doing what God's called you to do. There's a principle in serving God that you don't get to move on to the next thing until you've done the first thing. And so many times we fail to do the first thing because we don't have an attitude of how can it be done. We fail and we're not moving on to what God has for us because we gave up on getting something done because it just didn't go the way we intended for it to go. He had a high work ethic. I'm going to get the job done. That's what you're going to write in your notes, number, number two or B or whatever it is on yours. Oh, I got one right here. B, high work ethic. I'm going to get this done. You can count on me. The next thing, oh my, the next thing, verse 12 Then he prayed. He was a man of prayer. He was a person of prayer. I preached a few Sundays ago about the well. Was anybody here the, the morning of the well? I was so moved by the message of the well. It has changed my thinking and my attitude. I'm not going to re-preach, re, re-go over any of that other than I want to Make sure I highlight that we have to revolve our life around prayer and not prayer around our life. When my kids get up in the morning time, I'm not at home when they get up. They know where I'm at. Dad's down at the church praying for us. Of all the things I want my kids to remember about me, I want them to know Dad got up early to pray And dad was a man of prayer. I don't care of anything else that they celebrate about me. Dad prayed. In that life of prayer, you learn to depend on the Lord. We, the servant in this story recognized he needed God's help to accomplish this task. He didn't know what history held. He hasn't read the rest of this book. He knew he needed God's help. He didn't know who was going to be coming to the well, but he did know God could help him to do the job and get the job done. A prayer, our perseverance in prayer is a picture of our dependency on God. The praying for the same thing for 10 years for it to come about doesn't show lunacy on our part. It shows our dependency on God to do something we can't ourselves do. And this servant here was a person of prayer. I've been a part of KC for a number of years, coming to early morning prayer. And I see a pattern. 
I'm just going to let you in on a little, shh, a little secret. I can always tell, not always, let me not use absolutes in this one. It's easy to tell who God is going to elevate next because you start seeing their life of prayer change before anything else. I know who God's going to elevate when I see their frequency at early morning prayer. And I also see people who have this great dream of being elevated by God and they're not at early morning prayer. If I'm choosing... If I'm the Lord looking for someone to fulfill something great for me, I think I'd be looking for someone who's crying out in dependency on me. Person of prayer. Where you at in your serving? Is prayer a part of your serving? Look at this this, uh, servant of Abraham. Oh my. Number, Number D. See if you're still awake. Number D. Did anybody hear that? Letter D. Letter D. Abraham's, not Abraham, but the servant, excuse me. The servants, I don't want you to miss this because it's very, I don't know. I don't know another way to say it. It's almost counterculture. Of westernized thinking. Didn't used to be, but it is now. I want you to flip, just kind of scan your eyes across that chapter again, and I want you to look at how many times the servant calls Abraham his master. The servant had a heightened understanding of honor, which is absent in the world, in our westernized world we live in. So thankful that the Lord had me for 15 years live on an island where there is a different concept of honor. My children grew up calling any older man or woman auntie and uncle as a matter of honor. Today we live in a oh, some kind of weird world where even Even great men and women of God in some sort of effort to reach people have told them they don't have to call them pastor, you don't have to call me minister, let's just be friends. I don't see that in the Bible. And in this servant right here, he understood loyalty and honor. How many times he references Abraham? You can't read this chapter without it jumping out at you. I'm going to tell you right here. I've got it written down. That's why I'm looking at my notes. The verses where he calls Abraham his master. In one chapter of the Bible. Are you ready? Verse 14, verse 27, verse 34, verse 35, verse 36, 37, 39, 42, 44, 48, 49, 51, 55, 56, and 66. Do you think there's a concept there that maybe we could adapt in our life of of loyalty and honor to the one we're serving? How do you, when you're in, in your serving the Lord, what is your reference to him in your serving? There's a lot of people that want to operate in authority, and there's a few principles about authority in the kingdom of God you need to understand. It's... You can't have a place of authority in the kingdom of God if you can't yield to authority. We learn to operate in God's authority by yielding to man's authority. That's the principle of how it works. This servant's got it figured out. Our westernized America has lost it in terms of honor. You can't receive from someone you don't honor. Did you know if you offer a cup of water to a prophet, what do you receive? It's honor. It's honor. We need a redefinition of honor. Moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, your kids need a whole different picture of honor than what they see on TV. 
my son, I'm just going to tell you what happened this week. My son, Elian, is one of the sharpest people I know. He loves to read Diary of a Wimpy Kid. <laughs> They're hilarious. They really take you back to being in junior high. I read them. I think they're hilarious. So we decided we were going to red box a Diary of a Wimpy Kid movie. So I, I got this one. I don't even remember which one it is. Oh, I was so looking forward to it because I'd never seen this movie. Then my son loves them, and I love the books. They're so funny. And from, I'm just telling you, from the very beginning that we push play, Till the time that I just couldn't handle it anymore and shut it off before the movie was over. So much disrespect for their parents, for adults. So much disrespect. How in the world are our children going to grow in what God has for them if they have no concept of honor in their life? We don't live in Hawaii any longer. I still require my kids to address older men and women as aunties and uncles. It ain't for you. It's for them. They are going to have a picture of honor in their life. As a servant of the Lord, we've got to have honor and loyalty. The servant's words reflected his honor. Even in his prayer, He's honoring his master, Abraham. He understood in his, in his uh, operating in honor that his job was to make Abraham great. Make Abraham great. Our self-serving, heightened individualism culture that we live in has no concept of serving to make someone else great. What if God's great calling in your life is to make somebody else look good? Do you think you could do that? You're going to have to crucify every American teaching on what life is really about to get that done. Do you think you could work your brains out, get no reward, and someone else get all the, all the honor for what you did? Could you do that? That is a great question for us to reflect on. He constantly kept before him who he was serving. He kept referencing his master. Trying to give you a, pic a different picture of serving because we desperately need one. Next, Roman numeral E. I'm not going to read all these verses here, but I want you to write this down. He had a high commitment to integrity and character. The servant, the chief servant who was entrusted with everything rides off into the sunset on a quest loaded, 10 camels loaded with treasure, looking for the most beautiful girl he can find. What kind of movie do you think they would make about that today? High commitment to integrity and character. He had every opportunity to change the whole story for his own benefit. You don't read in any of this chapter, you don't read anything about him serving for personal gain, about what he could get out of it. You don't see that in this story. He had an abundance of wealth. He engages in conversation with this beautiful virgin. He stands before Rebecca and, and Rebecca's family and gives an accurate account of his job and his role and what he's supposed to do. He had every opportunity to turn that into a personal advantage. And he, had enough, he had enough wealth to live on the rest of his life, 10 camels worth. He could have lied about the whole thing and taken advantage of this girl and her family and went off and did their own thing. No personal gain here. He's the chief servant. Where are you at in your serving? How much quest for personal gain is there in your serving? 
We'll get to the back side of the paper in just a minute. Next. Verse 26. He wasn't just a person of prayer. He was a worshiper. He wasn't just, oh God, help me. He was also, oh God, how great you are. It's both. He sees the Lord is giving him success. He sees the lady... Rebecca and her family, and he bows down to worship the Lord. He gave credit to where credit was due. He acknowledged God's hand in the whole thing, that everything happened because God made it happen. He was a worshiper. It was beyond seeking for God's help. He gave credit where God had done something. The next one, I like this one maybe the most. He understood priorities. So here he is before Rebecca's family and they throw these, you know, they're putting food before him. They're going to treat him all nice. He gave Rebecca a nose ring. How fabulous was that? So they're going to treat him really great. Is that what your mom was waiting on? Just kidding. Man, my wife and I love our first encounter stories. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody know what I'm talking about? The first time you met your spouse's family and all those things. We love to tell those stories. They're so fun. So here he is. The servant is going to, uh, sits down and they put all this food in front of him and they want to go through their, you know, fellowship time, and he says, no, 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 don't, you don't, you don't get it. I've got to tell you why I'm here first, and then we skip all those verses by the word of the Lord, hallelujah, because he recounts the whole thing to them. He understood priorities. He wasn't easily distracted away from what he was called to do. Even at the end, when they say, okay, you can have the girl... They say, oh, wait a minute, would you stay with us 10 more days? He goes, no, I cannot. I have to get back to my master. The servant, the chief's servant understood there are some things more important than others. And what my job is, what my role is, what my calling is from the Lord himself takes precedence over anything else you're going to try to distract me with. you got to understand in the, in the realm of serving the Lord and what he's called you to do, the, the, the enemy of all that God wants to have happen will make sure you get distracted from the calling on your life. I know what I'm called to do. I'm called to be here in Alaska and make that guy look good. That's what my calling is. Whatever comes along after that is just a part of it. That's, my, that's what I'm called to do. And I can tell you, I have received job offers, different mini ministry position offers, for different amounts of salaries, people that want to do different things to bless. There, there's, there's no option. That's, this is what I'm called to do. This is why I'm called to be here. I had a dream five years ago. A dream, I don't know if I usually tell these or not. I, I've never told any, I don't think I've told anybody, but maybe a select few. Should I share those? Do you want to hear something incredible? What time is it? Is it past bedtime? I got a long way to go, Pastor. I'm going to tell you something incredible. Five years ago, I'm in Maui with no intention ever of moving. I live two blocks from the beach, and I have a home that's worth a lot. God made happen. I had no intention of leaving. I've got a big ministry, lots of home runs and trophies to shout about. God gives me a series of five dreams that were so real that I knew, I knew that if I didn't respond, I was going to be judged for it. And the final one, the fifth one, was a dream about an enormous warehouse, empty warehouse. And I'm wearing a really, really big coat. I'm cold. (laughs) 
you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna like this because there's a one wall of the warehouse is all windows, floor to ceiling. And I could look out over an enormous river. And I'm sitting at a picnic table with a couple of people that don't matter to this story. And somebody says, they're coming, they're here. And we all stand up and we turn away from the windows and there's these little slots at the top of this huge warehouse. The slots open. It's kind of like those little mail slots, you know what I'm talking about? You probably don't use them here because like ice blows in, but little mail slot. Lowers, and I kid you not, thousands upon thousands, mountains of red salmon start flying into this warehouse, and they're piling up, and it's mountains of salmon, huge red salmon. And I look at the salmon, I'm not impressed, and I go over to the windows, and I'm looking out at the windows, which a number of things happen there. And uh, my uncle comes up to me, and I'm like, hey, what are you doing here? Pastor Chris, who will be here in a few weeks. He comes up to me with Pastor Melissa next Sunday. He'll be here next Sunday. Hey, you get two Davises in a row. And I said, well, what are you doing here? And he says these words, we're here for the grand opening. Does anybody... If you haven't seen some of the plans for our new building, one wall is all windows. I had no idea what that dream meant five years ago. But now here I'm in a place where my hands are never warm. <laughs> We're building a building with windows all on one side. And there's a highway that goes right in front of it that's like a river of people. They're coming. Praise the Lord. I've, been, I've had job offers and I've had thoughts in my mind of things I'd rather, you know, maybe you'd rather do this, maybe you'd rather do that. I won't be distracted from that dream and what God's called me to do. I want to be like the chief servant. Anybody else? The last thing is he was faithful. He finished the job. Whatever that cost him, he finished it. Now flip your paper over. He was faithful. It's on the same side? Well, mine's on two sides. If I'd look at this, it'd help, huh? I'm going to briefly... Give you a rundown of servant killers. Things in our things that happen that destroy our servanthood. I'm so impressed to, to release this today because it could be that some of collectively or individually, some of our serving needs these things to, buy, to be identified because if they're coming and if the warehouse is going to fill up with salmon. We cannot be doing things like we're doing them right now. That's why we're having a children's intensive this, this Saturday. What is it called? Circulation. circulation. We're having a children's circulation this Saturday. Because they're coming. Let me help you identify some things that will kill your ability to serve. Okay, the first one is the need for recognition. Are you aware that in the Sermon on the Mount, in one chapter, Jesus pinpointed and said three times the same thing? He draws a distinction between doing something to get people to clap for you and doing something for God's honor. God's reward. He who's the, when the Father sees what you do in secret, will reward you openly. And the nature of our selfish, sinful nature is I need somebody to applaud me for serving the Lord. 
The need for recognition will kill your ability to serve the Lord. So many people have offended and lose out on God because of this need, something inside you. It's your sinful nature and it's got to die. That I'm not going to do something for God unless people are watching and somebody knows about it. And if nobody was looking, I'm going to go tell somebody what I did for the Lord. When in all along, that whole little mind frame is the need for recognition. God does not ignore your serving. Please turn to Hebrews chapter 6 and pull out every color of highlighter you got and highlight this scripture. Please don't miss this. Hebrews 6.10 says, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. He's linking the work and serving people with love for him. You really got to ask yourself, if you're so desperate for somebody to clap for you, whose love are you expressing? Need for recognition. God is not going to ignore what you do for him. He's not going to pass it off as petty. To him, it's a big deal. When you, in your sinful nature, not seeing him physically, do something for him, do you think that's not a sweet-smelling aroma to him? It's the, one of the reasons he died for you is so that you could do something for him and offer up your life as a living sacrifice to him. You will lose your reward if you're doing it to get hand claps. Oh, sorry. Moving on. I'm looking at the bedtime. I know we got kids that got to get up for school tomorrow. B. Lord, help us. B. Unwilling to sacrifice. I used to have this fish in my office, and it was dying, and only one fin was working. And this poor, helpless, pathetic fish just wouldn't die. So it's in the tank, and it's just like... And so I would try to feed it, and it would, like, look at the food and ignore it. But it would eat it if it, by chance, happened to run into one of the pellets. So it's like, the whole top of the water's full of pellets and it can't see them. You know that's a picture of the way we serve the Lord? There is so much opportunity to serve the Lord and we wait till it's like convenient. We are that stupid fish. It will not be convenient for you to serve the Lord. Your body does not want to do the things of God. Romans 8 makes it clear. There's a reason Paul wrote in in Romans 12 to offer your body as a living sacrifice you're going to feel like it's cost you everything to serve the Lord to rearrange your schedule to give a little extra when they told you 5 o'clock and it's 5.01 and you're having to come apart I, can t- I told you I've worked with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. I've also had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people give me the lamest excuses why they couldn't do something for God. And it makes me angry. I wonder what the Savior hanging on the cross would think of our excuses for not sacrificing. I don't want him. I don't want to hear his opinion. I don't want to hear 
Jesus' opinion of what my sorry excuse for not sacrificing for the Lord is because he sacrificed it all. Held nothing back for you and me. Stood there embarrassed beyond description. We just did a men's encounter. And our, every time I watch that video of the passion, I can't handle, I can't control the tears. I wonder what that man who did all that for me would think and say, I don't even want to hear it. My lame excuse of why I can't do something for him. Pathetic. That's what he would call it. Please turn to Luke 18, 29. I want to encourage you. You probably feel like I've just punched you in the gut. And I know some of you didn't eat dinner yet, and the, the quest to satisfy yourself is overriding the words I'm saying. Let's look at Luke 18. Oh, here we are. 29. I tell you the truth, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. How big of a God do you serve? How big do you think he is? Do you not think that he could reward you a hundred times more than you gave for him? He can do that. Many times in the NIV is what it says here. He is not unaware of your sacrifice. It's a sweet aroma to him. He likes the smell of it. Moving on. The next thing is we, we destroy our ability to serve when we have the wrong value system. We will not serve a cause we believe is worthless. If you're watching the TV and some commercial comes on there to save the dandelions, would you please just donate $3 every month to save the dandelions? How many of you are going to donate? Come on, we're going to show you sad pictures of dandelions wilting, and some of them have lost their petals, and one of them got stepped on by a moose. How many of you? Come on, where's your heart? Don't you know the dandelions need help? They need your help. Would you please, for the love of all the flowers, donate today to save the dandelions? We're passionate about this, and I just spit as far as I've ever spit before. I'm telling you, I'm passionate about this because sometimes we, we treat serving the Lord like it's the dandelion commercial. If we don't value that what God has done for us, we won't do anything for him. We've got to value what the Lord did for us. It reciprocates into us doing something for him. If you're unwilling to serve the Lord in any capacity or you're just over it or just not into it or whatever. You don't have the right picture of the Savior hanging on a cross. You got the wrong value system. You're treating the God of the universe who died for you like it's the dandelion commercial. You've got to have the right value system. It'll kill your servanthood to have the wrong value system. We devalue our service when there's no spotlight on us doing it. Don't you love these lights right up here? They make me feel so important. If they're not there, I don't want to stand up here and do this. Next time you ask me to preach, can you make sure they're on? <laughs> Wrong value system. Actually, actually, there's some not on. Could you get those on too? Pastor Alex, help me out here. See these purple ones? I need them facing me. <laughs> Wrong value system. Number next. Are you ready for this? I'm glad you're laughing because I know it don't feel good what I'm saying. No respect for judgment day. Do you understand that you're writing a book? You don't know, maybe you don't realize it. You're writing a book. 
Revelation 20, verse 12, the great throne judgment. And there were open books. And on that day, they're going to open your book, and there's only one reader that matters on that day. Are you writing a book for that one reader? Or are you writing a book with your life for thousands of other readers who don't matter on that day? I'm trying to shake up your theology about what life's about. Trying to give you a new perspective of living your life for the king and for his kingdom. And not just treating it like it's something you do on the side when you got time. You're going to be judged for your life. You're going to be judged for your words. You're going to be judged for what you did with what he gave to you. Over and over again, Jesus gave parables of men who had something to do, had something to show for their, let me back up. He gave parables of men that were given something entrusted with and then gave an explanation of what they did with it and judged them accordingly. That's you and me. We're, we're that person. And when we don't have the right picture of judgment day, it affects our ability to serve the Lord. You need a fresh perspective of judgment day. You can't read through the Bible without understanding God's going to judge us. Look at Jesus' life. I've, I've been told a number of times I'm too intense. I've even, I even have to have people come and remind me to smile. It's not just one. It's been years of it. I've got a, part of it is I've got a clear picture of Judgment Day, and I'm focused. And I'm going to present to the Lord everything I can present to him. I know what he saved me from. I should be in hell today. I get up in the morning thankful that I'm not in hell. And it propels me to do something for what he's given me. The next thing, the next thing, write as big as you can on your paper because it's the big one. Are you ready? Probably not. Here we go. Write the word entitlement. The belief system that you deserve something will keep you from serving the Lord. Entitlement, the attitude, I deserve, will cripple your ability to serve the Lord, and then you'll stand on judgment today with nothing to offer for your life except for the thought and the feeling that you deserved something. I'm sorry I've kept you so long on preaching tonight. I have to unload what the Lord put in my heart weeks ago. I was waiting for a moment for Pastor Daniel to allow me to preach. Entitlement. We live in a nation that bases their life on what they think they deserve. And if they don't get it, they're going to sue somebody because it's what they deserve. Amen? That's right. We cannot approach serving God that way. What exactly do you think you deserve? God doesn't owe you a single thing. He didn't even owe you Jesus on the cross. He did it because of his great compassion and his love for you. He didn't owe you Jesus on the cross. Do you think Jesus wanted to die on the cross? He asked the Father to take the cup away from him. Please don't make me do this. I just spit like way out there again. Did you see that? Next time I'm going to put a target on the floor and see how many points I can get. Jesus begging the Father in anguish, begging the Father, please don't make me die on the cross. Please don't make me bear the sin of billions of people on me. He's the God of the universe. If anybody deserved anything, he didn't deserve to be on that cross. We deserve to be on the cross. God doesn't owe us anything. We owe God everything. 
We owe God a life dedicated to his glory. My master. The attitude of the servant, my master. Write this down on the back of your paper real quick. We need the attitude of Jesus, Philippians 2, who was God himself but humbled himself and became a man. Became obedient even to the cross. We need the attitude of Jesus to overcome these servant killers. The next thing is we need the compassion of Jesus. Jesus wanted to be alone. His friend had died. John the Baptist was murdered. He wanted to be alone. He gets on the boat and he goes across the lake. And as he's approaching the other side of the lake, he sees a multitude, multitude of people that need him. And he puts his own personal grief aside. The Bible says when he saw the large crowds, he had compassion on them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Something about the love of the Father has got to compel us. To accomplish what God's intention for Casey, Alaska to become. It can't be to make our name great. It's got to be the multitude that need a shepherd. We need the attitude of Jesus. We need the heart of Jesus. And then we need the vision of Jesus, who before he went to go die, said if a single kernel falls to the ground and dies... Now, if a single kernel remains a kernel, there, let's read it, because I'm going to get it all wrong. And then I'm going to hand this over to Pastor Daniel, and I might run around the building, because I'm so stirred up. Luke 10, 7. And then I'll get out of the way. Luke 10, 7. This is not, that's not right. Excuse me, John 12, thank you. Can't read my own handwriting. John 12, please don't miss this. Jesus, the Lord of heaven, says to his, his uh, people, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. we got to have the vision of Jesus about serving and about laying his life down. My time's up. I wish I could tell you some of the stories I wanted to share. But I had to unload these principles because they affect you and they affect me. And if you didn't notice, every one of those killers of being a servant stems from our sinful nature. We have to die. We have to be the kernel of wheat that falls to the ground and says, yes, Lord, I love you, Lord. Our serving the Lord has got to be something we do from the love we have for the Savior. Pastor Daniel. Come on, let's stand together. Somebody play uh, something up here. Pastor Daniel's going to take over in just a moment. We're going we're to respond. I hope there's a stirring in your heart. I hope there's a stirring in your heart. What we're going to do is we're going to make a little action not exactly the same action the servant of Abraham made stuck his hand under Abraham's thigh we're not going to do anything weird like that here tonight but if there's a stirring in your heart and you want to be like that chief servant and you want to make an oath before the Lord that you're willing to be a kernel of wheat to see what he wants to accomplish be accomplished Whatever it might cost you, I'm going to ask you to step out where you, from where you are and come join me up here. I'm the first one here because I'm willing to be the kernel of wheat because I love the Savior. I'm going to be a kernel of wheat. I'm going to be the chief servant. Lord, you can count on me by stepping out 
You're making a statement to the Lord of heaven. To deny that selfish, sinful nature, to crucify it and offer before him something more valuable than anything in this world has to offer. It's your life dedicated before him. To see what he intends to take place, take place. God has intentions. They will not happen without a people who are willing to be intentional about serving the Lord. Come on, let's take time to pray. I'm going to pray for you and me. Come on, you lift your voice. You make that commitment to him. You lay your life down before his life. It's your own words and your own phraseologies. But Lord, I thank you, God, for this word tonight. Thank you, God, for the word about the Abraham's servant. I long to be the chief servant. I don't need my name in the chapter. But I want to help change history and everything that happens after the... Because I was willing to live by these principles and lay my own life down and seek your glory. Lord, we stand before you here tonight saying, Oh God, do a rearranging in my heart, in my mind. Help me to put to death all of those greedy things that my sinful nature desires and help me God to seek your glory give me a new definition of judgment day redefine my value system oh God wash over my mind all the all the teaching that this westernized culture has ingrained in me since childhood about what my child is what my, my life is supposed to be like and what is really important and really valuable. Oh God, give me a new definition of life. May we be like the servant in the field who came in wanting to be done, but his master said, now go prepare a meal for me. And may our response will be, we just did our duty. We owe you everything. We owe you a life for the one you gave us. We owe you our mornings and our nights and our dreams and our hopes, our selfish ambitions crucified. We owe you. It's our duty. It's our duty to serve you regardless of what some kind of special calling we think we have. It's our duty it's our duty to serve you and to express our love for you by what we do so a world can see our good deeds and glorify you oh God we humble ourselves today in this Sunday night we're asking you God to put a fresh stirring and an engine in us that drives us. We get up in the morning yearning to do something for your glory. Oh God, put a fresh set of convictions in us when we try to seek our own fame. Have somebody applaud us. Oh God, we're unworthy servants. We just did our duty. Jesus' name we pray. We commit to you, God. We commit to you.